and I, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me from 9pm to midnight every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on your telly, radio and online. Today we're going to be discussing the upset surrounding the Foreign Secretary's comments on the ever-controversial Qatar World Cup. We'll be looking at how affluent drug users will be subject to more police crackdowns in the south of England. And the police won't be investigating Tory MP Lee Anderson over his comments regarding Labour's Eddie Izzard. But first, here's the news with Alice Porter. Good afternoon. It's two o'clock. I'm Alice Porter in the GB Newsroom. A whistleblower at an asylum processing centre in Kent has told GB News the government is not acknowledging the true extent of the crisis there. The worker at the Manston military base claims violence, disease and attempts of self-harm are a daily occurrence at the facility. The processing centre is only supposed to hold asylum seekers for no more than 24 hours before transferring them to longer-term accommodation. But many have allegedly been there for weeks in unsuitable living conditions. Former Chief Immigration Officer Kevin Saunders says the problem lies with the legislation. 80% of people coming across the channel are from Albania. And we do have legislation, of course, that we can remove them. However, and here's the problem, the um, people that advise these uh, refugees as saying, just say to the UK authorities that you've been trafficked, because once you've said that, they can't remove you. Meanwhile, at least 12 small boats carrying around 500 people have been intercepted crossing the English Channel so far today. Authorities are still actively responding to other sightings. Border force vessels and lifeboats are taking them to Dover. They'll then be transferred to the Manston military base for processing. The head of the Royal Navy has ordered an investigation into what he's called abhorrent allegations of sexual assault and harassment in the submarine service. Admiral Sir Ben Key says the behaviour will not be tolerated and is not a true reflection of what service life should be. He says anyone who's found to be culpable will be held accountable regardless of their rank or status. Octopus Energy will buy collapsed supplier bulb after the deal was given the green light by the government. Octopus says it's paying the government above market value to take on the company's 1.5 million customer. Business Secretary Grant Shapp says the move brings vital reassurance and energy security to consumers across the country at a time when they need it most. The deal is expected to be completed by the end of next month. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of murder of a university student in Manchester. Luca Connor was stabbed in the early hours of Wednesday morning and later died in hospital. A 19-year-old is being questioned by police.
The Foreign Secretary says countries need to work together to starve terrorists of money and technology. Addressing a United Nations meeting in India, James Cleverly urged allied states to tackle terror groups' use of technology to recruit and radicalise people. He called for more pressure to be put on big tech companies. We're also working with the G7 and Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. And we continue to press tech companies, amongst whom are some of the Internet's biggest players, to crack down even harder on extremist content online. The UK has denied an accusation by Russia, suggesting the Royal Navy blew up the Nord Stream gas pipelines last month. Moscow didn't offer any supporting evidence. The government here had described it as false claims on an epic scale. It comes after Russia declared the end of its Ukraine mobilisation campaign as their target of 300,000 people had been met. The controversial move led to tens of thousands of Russian men fleeing the country. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky says he doubts Moscow is done with calling up soldiers. Thousands of mothers are demonstrating across the country demanding reforms to childcare. The Halloween-themed protest called the March of the Mummies is calling for urgent progress on women's rights. They say expensive childcare, along with poor maternity and paternity benefits, are pushing mothers out of the workforce and into poverty. They want the government to increase funding for the sector. Beth is a mum marching in central London. Unfortunately, when I go back to work, I basically will be giving my entire salary over to um, my childcare costs. So essentially, it's not worth me going back to work. But I want to go back to work and I want to be part of the workforce and I love my job and I don't want to take a career break. But unfortunately, I, I will have peanuts to survive on, which is really difficult when you want to uh, spend time with your daughter, uh, do fun things, and there's just not enough money. Railway staff in Scotland are staging a 24-hour walkout over a pay dispute. More than 2,000 members of the RMT union are striking and passengers are being warned to expect widespread disruption. ScotRail say the latest offer gives the lowest paid staff a basic pay increase of almost 7.5%, but the union is calling for a rise that's more in line with inflation. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Darren. Welcome to Real Britain. I thank you very much for your company. Here's what's coming up on the show today. Football fans are counting down the days until the FIFA World Cup begins in Qatar. But the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, urged the travellers to be respectful of the host nation. I'm asking, does he have a point? Police forces across the southwest of England are set to crack down on people using so-called recreational drugs. But how on earth are they going to enforce that one? Tory MP Lee Anderson won't be investigated by police for his supposedly transphobic comments about Labour candidate Eddie Izzard. Lee's going to join me later on in the show. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, your thoughts are much more important than mine. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. I've got it open right here. You can watch us online on YouTube. And don't forget about Facebook. Loads of cracking content on our page. Cheers very much. Before all that, I want to talk to you about some pretty damning home truths that came out of the Commons Homes Affair Select Committee earlier this week. It actually exposed the sheer scale of Britain's border problems. We've got more holes than Swiss cheese. We're leakier than a sieve. It's more exposing than a Prince Harry memoir. It actually revealed that the government is now spending seven million quid of your money a day on housing asylum seekers in hotels, a figure that officials reckon will continue to rise. Meanwhile, of course, Brits here at home can it bank on the government offering them hotel accommodation if you find you cannot pay your mortgage or indeed your gas bill. Officials also admitted that the interception rate made by French police of migrants that are attempting the journey across the English Channel has actually fallen. Begs the question, why the hell are we continuously offering President Macron more and more in taxpayer millions? And what about the migrants actually arriving here? Who are they? What did we learn? 
Well, if you listen to some Labour Party MPs protesting, you'd think they were mostly women and children fleeing war-torn states and persecution. Have a listen to this MP speaking back in April. Those who arrive on our shores are fleeing war, they're fleeing persecution, they're fleeing poverty. They faced an arduous journey and risked their lives to get here. They are desperate people looking for sanctuary, looking for a new life in a safe place. Except that's largely not the case, is it? That was La Labour's Nadia Whittam giving us the facts in the attempt to play on the nation's heartstrings with the world's tiniest violin. According to the same officials, 12,000 Albanians have arrived in the UK after crossing the Channel so far this year. And those are the ones that we actually know of, of which 10,000 of those, so 10,000 of that 12,000 figure, are single adult men. That's compared to 50 in 2020. Albania is not some war-torn nation that fits the narrative of the media and politicians. Government figures circulated earlier this year claimed about 60% of all migrants make and channel crossings every day were from Albania, facilitated by criminal gangs from that country that have established themselves in the north of France. And this is all costly stuff, right? The UK's asylum system has topped £2 billion a year with the highest number of claims for two decades. The deceit, right, that this, this is a, a group of refugees fleeing cheese, baguettes or cholesterol in France. It's frankly nonsense. All of this information backs up Suella Braverman's determination to end this open border madness, a key demand of the British people in election after election for almost a generation now. Between 2001 and the Brexit vote in 2016, our population increased by 6.5 million people, most of which was from immigration. Now, Suella Braverman is the only politician to actually identify that the override of European human rights law is necessary to truly take back control. And you see, that's why Labour are so desperate to get her out as Home Secretary. She gets that many are now of the view that the government is lying regarding wanting border controls and that it would be easy for my colleague Nigel Farage to snap up these votes from both Labour and the Tories. Suella, in contrast to Sir Keir Starmer, gets that politicians need to hold woke police chiefs to account and have them tackle actual crime, not thought crime or tweets. Suella said we need more PCs and less PC. Couldn't agree more. Reports suggest that it was Suella in Cabinet that stood against a Liz Truss plan to introduce a growth visa that would liberalise our migration rules. She gets that this would be taking the Tories so far away from that 2019 mandate. So I say, thank goodness for Suella. Thank goodness for the fact she's there to put our views forward around that cabinet table. Even the Church of England has be jumped on the anti-Suella bus. Bishop Paul Butler, Bishop of Durham, asked whether it was wise in seeking to offer integrity and leadership to reappoint the Home Secretary. And as the North West Durham Tory MP Richard Halton asked, don't remember Bishop of Durham or any other church or of England bishop questioning Jeremy Corbyn's suitability when he was Labour leader presiding over a party riddled with anti-Jewish racism. Nor Mandelson in the new Labour era seems pretty party political to me. He's right. The attacks on Suella, so vociferous in their nature, are because she knows, she knows what the Red Wall voters want. She knows the concerns and she knows what ne necessary measures are needed to actually tackle them. We need radical and politically brave solutions. And I tell you what, without her, I fear they would be lost. And clearly, ask yourself, the Labour Party and the media class must be in agreement with me. So I say back your home secretary, Rishi, and in doing so, you'll be tapping into the 2019 coalition that is at real risk of losing for an entire generation.
On to the meat of that topic now that I discussed at the top of the show. Foreign Secretary James Cleverley faced criticism this week after suggesting British football fans at the Qatar World Cup should be respectful of the host nation. This was in the wake of activist and campaigner Peter Tatchell having his pro-LGBT protests stopped by Qatari authorities. The latest development in the story is that the Prince of Wales will reportedly not attend the competition next month due to a busy schedule, although he has said he suggested he may consider, reconsider, attending if England actually make the final. So were Cleverley's comments insensitive or merely prudent? Advice and reassurance to ensure the safeties of British citizens who are, let's not forget, in a foreign land. Well, joining me to discuss this is the activist and campaigner Peter Tatchell himself and the commentator David Aldroyd bolt I thank you both for your company. Peter, I want to start with you. What actually happened in Qatar? What actually took place when you were out there demonstrating? Well, I was making a protest uh, primarily about the abuse of LGBT plus rights in Qatar, where gay people can be arrested, jailed, tortured, even subjected to horrendous, vile, uh, so-called conversion treatments to turn them straight. Conversion treatments that often cause mental breakdowns and, in one case I know, caused a young man to commit suicide. But also about the rights of women and uh, migrant workers. Uh, Qatar is in clear violation of international human rights standards. It has agreed to be a member of the United Nations, and that gives an obligation to sign up to and to implement the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which guarantees equal treatment and protection against discrimination to every citizen. It is not doing that. OK, it is but Peter... And a the, police state. The Qataris are saying the Qatari government have denied actually arresting you. How do you actually respond to that? They're saying totally fine. Well, look, that is what dictatorships do. When they are protested and exposed, they seek to discredit the protesters by claiming that the protest never took place or the person was never arrested, the person was never beaten up. That's nonsense. I was held for 49 minutes. I was not allowed to leave. I was threatened uh, that I could not leave and would face dire consequences if I attempted to leave. Um, it was only after 49 minutes that I was allowed to go on my way. That is, you can call it arrest or detention or whatever, I was held on the pavement there for all that time. Okay. But, you know, it's not really about me. This is about the people of Qatar, whose human rights are being violated daily by a dictatorship. The idea that we should show respect, that football fans should show respect for a police state dictatorship is absolutely profoundly shocking coming from a government minister. OK, so, David, turning to you, I know you don't actually support Qatar's laws concerning gay people, neither do I. I think they're abhorrent. But I'm of the view that actually what James cleverly said there, which is, you know, you're in a foreign land, the laws of the land are different to ours, the values in that land are different to ours, so respect them. Respect is the wrong word. I think that was a mistake on the Foreign Secretary's part. What he should have said is that if you take the decision to travel to Qatar, uh, disagreeing with the laws that they have, which would be entirely reasonable given that they're by any standards, uh, pretty abhorrent laws, you must be prepared for the fact that if you demonstrate against them, if you flout them, then you will be penalised for this, whether that's through being detained or being deported. Uh, I don't think there's any onus on anybody to have respect for things that are thoroughly um, lacking in any facet of what we could possibly respect. There is an onus on you when you go to a foreign country to abide by that country's laws whether or not you agree with them. If you were to go to the United States at the age of 20 and try and buy and drink in many states, you'd be arrested and get, you'd be thrown out. Uh, you know, if you were to, in fact, if you would go to the United States and cross a road without crossing at, a, at the right point, you would, you would be arrested. The point is that the Foreign Secretary's, I suppose, uh, intention was correct, but his phrasing was shoddy. OK, so, Peter, on that point, then, if, were some Qatari ambassador to come over here and, you know, attempt to tell us that actually we're far too liberal a society and attempt to, you know, hector all of us on our treatment of goodness only knows what. I'm assuming, Peter, that you're, you would give very short shrift to that argument and tell the Qatari ambassador to sling his hook. No, I wouldn't. 
I would defend the right of the Qatari ambassador to say whatever he wants. This is a free country. We believe in free speech. So we are, have, a, have a very different set of standards and values to Qatar, and we apply them here as we would seek to have them applied anywhere. But the other thing I want to say about James Cleverly is in his statement, what was truly shocking is he was suggesting in particular that LGBT plus fans should compromise their sexuality to appease the dictatorship. But he never sent a single word in that statement criticizing Qatar's gross abuse of LGBT plus people or women or migrant workers. So he yeah. was like really, whether by intent or default or just sheer clumsiness, he was actually doing PR for the Qatari regime. So, David, on that point then, looking at what the Foreign Secretary actually said and looking at what the England LGBT Group 3 Lions Pride have actually responded to his comments, saying it's an extremely unhelpful intervention, do you think the Foreign Secretary has a duty to actually be a proponent of the West's values abroad? Uh, yes, to a point. The Foreign Secretary's job uh, does entail, of course, extolling British values. But it's not really extremely helpful to, to, to foment or to concoct uh, any sort of rivalry, any sort of fight with a country like Qatar, which is by and large an ally of ours, uh, and much more so than many other Middle Eastern uh, states, Middle Eastern Islamic states, it should be said. Uh, so I think it's perfectly reasonable for the Foreign Secretary to say what he said. I don't think it's outrageous to suggest that LGBT plus people going to Qatar should perhaps hold themselves back a bit from expressing that in the way that they would feel able to do here. It is perhaps a matter of safety, that if they go there, uh, and is, as is their right to express themselves, they must be prepared for the fact that there are going to be consequences. And for the Foreign Secretary to warn people of these consequences and advise them, as he has, that perhaps it would be in their own best interest not to act in the way that they would feel free to act here, um, I think is entirely congruent with the role that he possesses. So, David, are you saying, well, Peter, you know, you made your bad lie in it? No, I wouldn't say anything so crass or silly. I would say that Peter has a right to go to Qatar and express himself and he ha as he has. I think he's exceptionally brave to do it. His courage uh, over many, many decades in, uh, in, in, in carrying out protests of this sort is laudable. But I'm sure that Mr Tatchell knows uh, better than anyone on this channel what the consequences are going to be. And I think it's reasonable that the Foreign Secretary should, should say, should have said, that there are dangers to this. That if you go to a country, and a deeply Islamic country like Qatar, which has repressive laws against homosexuality, as it does against the use of alcohol, for instance, then there are going to be consequences for flouting those laws. Exactly. Well, hey, I'll tell you can, what, can, can I say on that, that note. Yes, Peter, very, very briefly. I'm just going to say that I was prepared to pay the consequences. Indeed. I feel so strongly and feel it's so important to support those many brave Qatari people who want democracy and human rights. It's so important to show solidarity with them that I was prepared to go to prison if necessary. Of course, I didn't want to, but I was prepared to. I was prepared to accept the penalty. OK, well, I tell you what, the lack of alcohol is enough to put me off going full stop anyway. So we'll leave it there, folks. That was Peter Tatchell, the activist and campaigner, and David Aldroyd Bolt, the political commentator. I thank you both very much for your thoughts. There's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. After the break, I'm going to be discussing police forces across the southwest of England who are reportedly set to crack down on people using so-called recreational drugs. But how on earth are they going to actually enforce it? First of all, let's have a quick look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking wet at times and some rain pushes northwards, though drier further south. Let's look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it should be a largely dry end of the day. A few showers are possible, but many will have clear skies to start the night. Also, mostly dry in the southeast with clear spells after an exceptionally warm day. It will be a very mild evening, though brisk winds. A few showers are possible across Wales, and here some low clouds may lead to hill fog in parts. Otherwise, it will be largely dry. Also, a little mist and murk is possible for the West Midlands. Most, though, will have a dry evening with clear skies. Still breezy, so temperatures not dropping much, meaning it will still stay mild. It will be somewhat cloudier in the northeast here. There will still be some showery rain at first this evening, turning drier and clearer from the south as we go through the night. 
cloudier and wetter picture across much of Scotland as spells of rain continue to push northwards, perhaps heavy for some, turning a little chilly under any clear breaks that develop. Some showers are likely this evening across Northern Ireland. We'll also be blustery here, but plenty of clear skies. A relatively mild evening given the time of year. The rain in the north will clear overnight, meaning it will be largely dry before heavy showers feed in from the west. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on your digital radio. Now, lots of years have been getting in touch. I thank you very much for doing so. Let's have a look at what years have been saying. Mark says, if illegal immigrants claim they have been trafficked, shouldn't the natural response be to send them back to the home they were stolen from? That seems the most humane thing to do and what I, and what I would want if I had been trafficked. Valid point. Edward says, the blame for the migrant crisis lies firmly at the door of the civil servants in the Home Office who have prevented successive Home Secretaries from carrying out policies designed to crack down on the matter. And I wonder to what degree that is actually true, because I worry that the, the likes of Priti Patel, who clearly had the motive, she clearly wanted to put in place radical reform that you and I would actually want to see, she couldn't do it. What was the block? What was preventing her from doing it? That's what I want to know. David says, Labour are in no position to now talk about the migrant crisis after many of the MSPs wore T-shirts and held banners saying, migrants welcome, effectively encouraging them to make the perilous journey. Yeah, David, I remember a certain shadow home secretary, Yvette Cooper, wearing one of those very T-shirts. She either was wearing a T-shirt or, or she was holding a sign, but it definitely had that slogan on. Lucas says, I'm gay and I agree with James Cleverly that if you go to Qatar, then respect their laws and culture. Just the same as a person coming to Britain should respect our laws and culture. It does beg the question, though, why they thought Qatar would be a good place to host the World Cup when it could exclude a huge group of fans. And that's similar sentiments to actually what I'm getting in my inbox here, saying why is no one blaming FIFA for awarding the World Cup to Qatar? I do actually blame FIFA. Dave says, what did Tatchell expect protesting about LGBT rights in Qatar? They have a different view of LGBT rights. I wouldn't walk around Saudi Arabia kissing my wife whilst eating a bacon sandwich because I know it's disrespectful. He did this for his own bloated self-importance 
and publicity for the lifestyle he promotes. Well, Dave, I don't know if it's a lifestyle because I, I, I disagree with that. I didn't wake up one day and decide to be gay, but hey-ho, I agree with the, for, the start of your point, at least. Carl says, in respect of following the laws and cultures of other countries, I don't doubt we should respect them. I respect the traditions of other countries that don't violate human rights and hinder happiness that allows people to truly thrive in life. James Cleverly is wrong to ask people who have the freedom of choice to then go to another country and hold back their normal freedoms just to keep, please, a dictatorship for the sake of politics. And that, I think, calls into question why we gave them the World Cup in the first place. It should never have happened, in my view, but we are where we are. Moving on, folks. Police forces are planning a crackdown on affluent drug use in a change from the usual tactics of targeting drug dealers. Five forces in South West England and British Transport Police are taking part in the joint operation over concerns that marijuana, cocaine and other drugs are being used without legal consequences. Alison Hernandez, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Devon and Cornwall, said they want to remind recreational drug users that these things are illegal and make the environment so hostile that they choose not to do it. Well, joining me is the former Conservative London mayoral candidate, Sean Bailey. Sean, I know that this is something that you've campaigned on and spoken about in the past. You've long called for the police to go after affluent drug users. What do you say to those who have a concern that says, you know, an 18-year-old, Sean, in a job that they've just got after leaving school or what have you, doing God knows what. Should they really be penalised for the rest of their lives for making a mistake at 18? Well, let's look at this in a round. Let's talk about fairness. Let's talk about an 18-year-old boy who grows up on, a, on a, a, an estate somewhere in his country, feel he has no option but to be a drug dealer. He's about to be punished in that way. So why should anybody else face a different law to anybody else in this country? The law should be the same no matter who you are. And of course, our laws in this country often mean, particularly if it's marijuana, you will not be facing a very draconian sentence that will end your, your, your sort of forward progress in life. But for me, the first part of this is about fairness. Why does one community suffer from, from drugs policy and one community doesn't that's the first question that needs to be answered and the police's response to that remembering their job is to enforce the law the same for everybody is correct they should be focusing on the market not just the dealers drug dealers exist because the marketplace exists and if you want to reduce drug use you also have to reduce the amount of people who are calling for those drugs yeah because i guess many people would think that recreational drug use you know it doesn't harm anyone you're not in the actual sale of the product but how would you respond to that? Because you actually believe, Sean, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but actually, you know, middle class consumers of cocaine, for example, have got a lot to answer for. Well, let's test this hypothesis that it doesn't affect anyone. Let's go all the way back to where many of these drugs come from, South America, Colombia. Those countries are known for their massive rates of murder, kidnap, drug cartels. That's the drugs you then hear using in Europe. Let's talk about communities closer to home. How many people who are nice, lovely, polite, you know, middle class drug users who can afford the drugs? They're not out robbing anyone. But of course, the people providing the drugs are. You are generating that activity. And of course, if you look at London, drug use is so high in London that we're now exporting that crime to other parts of the country through county lines. Look at the young people you're affecting there. The carnage and the, and the war on the streets of London is being driven by people who are having drugs with no, with no consequence. And that consequence needs to be changed. Excuse me, I think the light's just gone funny. Oh, yeah, flicker in there. I do hope no one's got epilepsy, Sean. Um, do you <laughs> actually think this host creating a hostile environment, just very briefly, if you would, do you think that's actually going to reduce use drug use in places like London and the South East? I think what it'll do is get people to think twice. I've always said to people, you might use drugs, it has no effect in your community. Look at the effect it has beyond your community. I don't believe these people want people to suffer, but that is what's happening. And the police have to enforce the law fairly, so it's the correct thing to do. Absolutely, and I hope this is a call to get on the streets and off of our tweets, Sean Bailey. But there we are. Sean Bailey, former Conservative London mayoral candidate, I thank you very much for your time and contribution.
Now, folks, you are with GB News on telly and DAB Radio. I thank you very much for your company. After the break, Tory MP Lee Anderson won't be investigated by police for allegedly transphobic comments about Labour candidate Eddie Izzard. Lee's going to join me after the break. Now, though, it's time for a check on the news headlines with Alice Porter. It's 2.33. I'm Alice Porter in the GB Newsroom. A whistleblower at an asylum processing centre in Kent has told GB News the government is not acknowledging the true extent of the crisis there. The worker at the Manston military base claims violence, disease and attempts of self-harm are a daily occurrence at the facility. The processing centre is only supposed to hold asylum seekers for no more than 24 hours before transferring them to longer-term accommodation but many have allegedly been there for weeks in unsuitable living conditions. Meanwhile, at least 12 small boats carrying around 500 people have been intercepted crossing the English Channel so far today. Authorities are still actively responding to other sightings. Border force vessels and lifeboats are taking them to Dover. They'll then be transferred to the Manston military base in Kent for processing. The UK has denied Russia's suggestion that the Royal Navy was responsible for the Nord Stream gas pipeline explosions last month. The Ministry of Defence dismissed it as false claims of an epic scale, saying Moscow is trying to detract from its disastrous handling of the illegal invasion of Ukraine. It comes after Russia declared the end of its mobilisation campaign after reaching its target of 300,000 reservists. Octopus Energy will buy collapsed supplier Bulb, taking on its 1.5 million customers after the deal was given the green light by the government. Business Secretary Grant Shapps says the move brings vital reassurance and energy security to consumers. The sale is expected to be completed by the end of next month. Thousands of mothers are demonstrating across the country, demanding reforms to childcare. The Halloween-themed protest, dubbed the March of the Mummies, is calling for urgent progress on women's rights. They say, expense child, they say expensive childcare, along with poor maternity and paternity benefits, are pushing mothers out of the workforce and into poverty. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Join me, Nana Akuir, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. Uh. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and of course fun every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me from 9pm to midnight every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News.
Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on your digital radio. Now, the Met Police have said that no criminal offence was caused by Lee Anderson MP. His comments on Eddie Izzard after he was reported for one of those hate crimes by a councillor. Anderson had this to say. The old traditional work and class Labour voters will take a look at Eddie Izzard and think, you know, is that what's coming to Parliament? A spokesman for the Met Police said the complaint has been assessed and no offences have been identified. As a result, no further action will be taken. Now, while Eddie Izzard has said critics should join the 21st century, well, we'll see what Lee Anderson has to say about that. Joining me is the man himself, Conservative MP Lee Anderson. Lee, I know you've got a Mansfield Town kick-off at three o'clock, so I'll be brief. What do you make of Eddie Izzard saying that people like you need to be dragged, kicking and screaming into the 21st century? Well, look, Darren, um, I mix with two sets of people in, in my in my in my life. Half the week I spend in London, I spend that with MPs, lords, lobbyists, civil servants, staffers, and the media. Uh, the other, the rest of the week, I spend with real people in places like Ashfield. I, I see people in the pub, my friends, my family, the constituents that I represent, and they're the people I take notice of. And they're the people that tell me every single week when I get off that train, Lee, you're speaking on behalf of us. Look, I'm not here to, to try and upset one particular group of people. What I'm here to do is represent my constituents to speak on their behalf. And I can tell you this, Darren, that when I came home yesterday, as I walked up from the train station, people were saying to me, they were coming out of the shops like they normally do, Lee, you've done it again, you've said what we're thinking. And Darren, why ever I'm in Parliament, I will keep saying what my constituents are actually thinking. Yeah, because the Ashfield councillor who reported you to the police, by the way, I think that's a waste of police time. I think all of this stuff where it's yeah. arguments and disagreements with each other, that's not a police matter in my opinion. Yeah. But he actually said that the morals, you've got the morals of a 1970 yeah. working man's club comedian. Yeah. Now, I, I thought that had a certain amount of sneer and contempt, actually, Lee. Yeah, but this is the same councillor. Darren, if you have to happen to Google this this character, this is a man who's uh, been pictured on a regular basis with the late Cyril Smith. This is a councillor that defended Cyril Smith, and this is a councillor actually doesn't even live in the oh, area. Right. I think he lives in yeah. he lives in Wales. So this is the but, kind of character that we're, that we're dealing with. Of course, he's not here to defend himself, and I'm sure he would have much to say to the accusations laid out there to him. I want to read you out an email that I've just received about, in our last package, Lee, we were talking about a clampdown on affluent middle-class drug users. And uh, Jack has written in and he says, get real, the police don't even come out if your house is robbed. And I'm wondering the extent to which the speech, your speech, can be investigated by the police, but Jack's saying here, oh. you don't, they don't come out if your house is robbed. Do you reckon, Lee, that the priorities of British policing are out of kilter with your constituents. I, I, yes, of course, I agree with you, Jack's email. Look, I think this policing by consent has gone a little bit too far. I always hark on to the days when, when I was a teenager and we got into a, a spot of bother. The police were much more firmer those days. I lived through the minor strike in 84. I, I see now um, the uh, the police dealt with the striking miners on the picket lines. They fast forward 30 odd years and look how they're policing on the streets of London and the rest of the country now with these protests, as we see. And I think, you know, we've got it all wrong, Darren. We, we, we're far too soft. You know, the police need to be much, much tougher. And, and it's quite right, Jack, is that uh, police often now don't come out to, to burglaries and, and, and crimes in the home when they should do. They seem to be uh, far too busy in some areas investigating silly complaints like the one made against me. Yeah, exactly. Why do you reckon, Lee, that many people in the media and indeed in politics, many colleagues of yours in Parliament, might be afraid to actually stand up and say, well, you know, I, I hold the view that Eddie Izzard you, is, is not a, a, a woman, a, you know, a biological woman, and that can be viewed as a shocking thing to say, right? You cannot say that. You won't be invited to London dinner tables and all the rest of it, candlelit suppers. And many people out there have just had an email from David, and David says that you are an absolute legend, Lee. He says he's glad the police aren't investigating and that you speak for many of us work and class people. And now I'm wondering, why is it that many politicians are so afraid? 
Well, I think the difference for me, um, Darren, is I'm not interested in going to candlelit dinners and being invited to functions or anything like that, you know. I don't even like going to London that much, if I'm honest. I, I, um, I love my job. I love representing the people of Ashfield. Uh, and like I say, I'm not here to, to score brownie points. I'm not there to, to be invited to these functions. And I'm not there to have a career in politics. I'm there for the people of Ashfield. I'm their voice. I'm born and bred here. I've worked here all my life, never lived more than five miles from where I was born. I know what working class people are thinking. And I have every right to go down to that place. When I speak to you like in the media, I, I shoot from the hip. And I, and I say the things that Ashfield folk are saying to me on a weekly basis. In a word, then, some of my viewers are concerned that Suella Braverman, she's just, she's, you know, saying all the right things, but is she going to actually act upon them? Do you have faith in Ali? I have faith in Suella. I think she's the best we've got. She and I met her privately many, many times. If government get behind her, if the cabinet get behind her, and number 10 get behind her, I expect great things from Suella. All right, Lee. Good luck in your footy match with Mansfield Town. I hope the win. Lee Anderson, an MP there, the Conservative MP for Ashfield. Thank you very much. Now, folks, Rishi Sunak this week became the UK's first Asian Prime Minister. In what is surely a reminder that this isn't some swivel-eyed, institutionally racist backwater like so many of the commentary at class are keen to paint us as. If an Asian man can reach the highest elected office in the land, that surely suggests that people are indeed, by and large, judged on the content of their character and their suitability for high office rather than the colour of their skin. But of course, many on the left are avoiding this obvious conclusion. A Guardian columnist wrote that Sunak's victory is tinged with bitterness because of his conservative views. A Labour MP tweeted that his appointment isn't a win for Asian representation before being ordered by her party to delete it. And of course, Trevor Noah, race baser that he is, the American talk show host, ludicrously claimed that there had been a widespread racist backlash to the new Prime Minister before being rebuffed by Number 10 themselves. Where was this racist backlash? I haven't seen it. Well, joining me to discuss this is Sunil Sharma, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth. I thank you very much for your time. Now, are you of the view that the left, because it is primarily coming from pillars of pockets of the left, you know, Trevor Noah is a yep. left-wing political host. You've got Labour MP Nadia Whittam, and then you had, of course, the Guardian columnist writing that article. Why do you think it is pockets of the left that say, if you are a Conservative, you know, you're not a real Asian? You, what yep. they said, do you remember what they said about Kwasi Kwarteng? Yeah. The, these sort of things are coming through thick and fast, aren't they? I, I think what they're failing to understand, the concept that because of your skin colour, religion, race, you should think a certain way, I would argue is so much more racist than, you know, um, than even a, a racial slur. The, the concept that Rishi Sunak, because he's conservative, isn't a win for, I don't know, ethnic minorities is bizarre. I think it's, it's very, it's a strange mentality. Um, I think it's almost, you're no longer... Indian, Hindu, Asian, black, if you believe in certain things that you're not prescribed to believe in, which is, you know, it's it's almost like a mental slavery kind of aspect. I don't know how else to really describe it. I, for me, it's 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 racism if it's coming from, let's just say, a non-Indian towards Rishi Sunak. If it's coming from a fellow Indian to Rishi Sunak, then it's mental slavery. He shouldn't have to think a certain way because he's brown, Hindu, Indian. He should be able to do what he wants and think how he wants. Exactly, because, I mean, even President Biden... Yeah. Of course, the US's highest political office, despite calling him Rashid Sanuk yeah. instead of Rishi Sunak, I'm not sure how he got that wrong, but he also said the Conservative Party and sort of laughed at the fact that Rishi Sunak could come from yeah. the Conservative Party to be elected as Prime Minister, to be put up as Prime Minister. Do you actually view that as an example of the left's racism? Yeah, racism, ignorance. I mean, Biden's got a, a record of this. He, he said in the last election about how, you know, you lose your, your black card if you vote Republican, if you're going to vote for Donald Trump, which is just, it's really, really bizarre. I think they're almost trying to force their narrative onto ethnic groups. You've got to let them think freely. And I think more importantly, we've, we're seeing this with British Indians and British Hindus in particular. If you look at the 
uh, people who voted Brexit, for example, the biggest ethnic group after British white people were British Indians. They came by far the highest. So this concept that because you're Indian, because you're black, you should have to prescribe to some sort of notion of thinking is so strange. Yeah. And I think it's something that the, the left has failed to understand. And I think that's why they're losing a lot of ethnic minority votes. We're seeing Labour for a long time, for example, had a massive Indian kind of base. Um, if you look for the 70s and 80s, that has been destroyed and almost it seems to be getting worse for them because they're just not identifying with some of the issues that these communities largely face. Yeah, because if you're working class, if you're homosexual, if you're you know, an ethnic minority, you are viewed as being a product of the left. You ought for to sure. be a product of the left. Yeah. And that, it, it, it derives, it, it, it deprives people rather of their autonomy, right? We're sure. all autonomous beings. We, we can make our own decisions. Well, I think I think that's the issue that they've have, and I think they've often they've neglected these natural groups. So whether it's homosexuality, whether it's uh, ethnic minorities, I think they've taken that for granted. They haven't actually listened to those issues. They haven't actually uh, made the the right sort of decisions. You look at sort of a lot of the immigrant culture in this country, um, a lot of them want to work hard, a lot of them have asp are very aspirational, start their own businesses, um, and those values don't go well with the left whatsoever, they're well, contradictory, we so, yeah. um, and I think they fail to understand that. A pitch for the Conservatives there, made better than any of them are making at the yeah. well, I thank you very much for doing it and coming on the show today. That was Sunil Sharma, Chief Operating Officer of Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth. Now, folks, a whistleblower at a troubled asylum processing centre in Kent has told GB News that the government isn't acknowledging the true extent of the crisis there. The source at the Manston military base claims violence, disease and attempts at self-harm are a daily occurrence at the facility. The processing centre is only supposed to hold asylum seekers for no more than 24 hours before they're transferred, transferred rather, to longer term accommodation. But many there have been there for weeks as the migrant crisis, of course, rolls on and on. Here's our home and security editor, Mark White, with this exclusive report. The situation inside this asylum processing centre is deteriorating rapidly, according to one man who works here. We're protecting his identity, but this whistleblower told us officials are not acknowledging the true extent of the crisis here. Incidents are being brushed under the carpet and not taken seriously. Weapons that have been found include knuckle dusters, knives, makeshift weapons that could slash or stab people. He also said some of those employed to guard the base were later revealed to have no right to work in the UK. The Home Office told us they're not aware of anyone employed at the base who didn't have a right to work there. The processing centre is only supposed to hold asylum seekers for no more than 24 hours before they're then farmed out to hotels and other longer term, more suitable accommodation. But the numbers arriving by small boat far outstrip the base's processing capabilities. Senior management don't have plans to move them out. Their solution is to bail them onto the site. They've breached detention laws and human rights. When someone is detained, they should be reviewed every 24 hours. This has not been done at all. He told us some people have been there for over a month, adding to the mounting tensions and worsening conditions at the base. Diphtheria has been confirmed, as has strep throat, sand flies and fleas throughout the tents. Migrants pelted staff with water bottles, injuring one member of staff. Migrants have self-harmed and one attempted to hang himself. Most staff aren't trained to deal or cope with this. We need to process applications here when people do arrive in this country much more quickly. Wherever you look with this government, it's a story of failure and lack of leadership. The whistleblower said staff at Manston have also now been told to classify those at the base as arriving passengers and not illegal entrants. He fears it will only be a matter of time before there is serious disorder here. Critical incidents have been declared. There are regular escape attempts, sit-down protests, threats of a dirty protest, fighting amongst migrants and assaults on staff. 
A Home Office spokesperson said the record numbers arriving by small boat continued to put the asylum system under incredible pressure. But Manston remains resourced and equipped to process migrants. Alternative accommodation will be provided as soon as possible. Mark White, GB News. Really revealing stuff there from Mark Weiss. We need to get a grip of this, don't we? Well, moving on, it's been revealed that Prince Harry's memoir will be released on January the 10th. I bet you can it wait. After being delayed following the Queen's death, it was originally due to be published in the autumn as part of a multi-million pound deal with Penguin Random House. But following the Queen's death and a number of alterations requested by the Duke of Sussex, the release was delayed. Now, Penguin Random House has described the book as an intimate and heartfelt memoir in which Prince Harry will offer an honest and captivating personal portrait. Well, joining me to discuss this is the fantastic royal broadcaster and commentator, Rafe heidel Manku. Rafe, thank you very much for your time. How do you think the royal family feel about this memoir? Do you think they'll be, you know, in a sheer shock of terror and anxiety at the prospect? Well, yes, I mean, for the royal family, this book has been rather like a dark cloud threatening to rain down over the royal residences. And that cloud, they've, ne they've never known actually when it's going to start to rain. And now at least we know January, they can, they can expect that thunderstorm to come down. Uh, we've also got the title now, Spare, which is a reference to the old expression, the heir and the spare, the heir being Prince William, Prince of Wales, and the spare being Prince Harry. And we already know from insiders in the royal family that they're quite hurt by the use of that title, given that so many members of the royal family tried to ensure that Prince Harry would avoid uh, some of the problems that spares, such as Princess Margaret and Prince Andrew, have experienced in the past. Uh, and of course, you know, how can you expect the royal family to feel when they will, he's talking about a raw and unflinching version of his life, to use the exact quotes, raw and unflinching personal journey from trauma to healing, to quote it pro properly. And forget spare, I'm thinking more spare me and spare us all from this lot of nonsense. Uh, I really only wish that the people he did spare were his father and his stepmother and his brother from a completely unnecessary uh, uh, catalogue of complaints he's going to unleash upon them just at the very moment when we are in the process of planning for the coronation. This is supposed to be a happy and joyous moment now as the king cements his new position, succeeding from his mother in such a terrible situation and tries to really bond with the Commonwealth realms, Canada and Australia and New Zealand, who don't know him very well, and suddenly to have this as your gift to your father for his coronation, a tell-all book, I think is quite scandalous. And there have been reports, of course, that you'll have seen that Prince Harry actually fought for the content of the book to be watered down after the Queen's death. Do you think this is a sign that he's had a bit of a, a wake-up call? Because I tell you what, the outpouring of grief in this country that you documented on this very channel, the, the outpouring of love, I would describe it, and of course Her Majesty the Queen herself said, you know, grief is the uh, price we pay for love. Do you think that's made yeah. Prince Harry think, oh my goodness, I can't attack the royal family as as prolifically as perhaps I wanted to. Well, let's just say that the uh, the Harry and Meghan are quite panicked by the turn of events. Uh, they hadn't actually expected. No one expected the Queen to die when she had, and the anticipation had been that they would be able to get away with this scandalous book in this documentary series whilst uh, the King Charles was still Prince of Wales. Because it's one thing to criticise the Prince of Wales. It's a very different thing when you are criticising the king, the sovereign, particularly so soon after the death of the last monarch, the queen. And so this has put all of their plans into disarray. And they are very embarrassed, I think, by some of the things that have already been recorded, particularly for the Netflix documentary, where Netflix are very keen to ensure that they don't edit out the best, most sellable, most watchable bits for un understandable reasons. Uh, their plan, we understand, had been essentially to release this book, release the documentary next year, yeah. and then in 2023 have a moment of reconciliation with the royal family. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't really work like that. And actually, no. there are a lot of discrepancies between the book and the documentary series about what Prince Harry has told two different stories. So it seems like he's got more than one personal truth that he's telling. 
Exactly. So that leads to reports, doesn't it, with Netflix saying, well, you know, what, what was the truth, right? Either the book's right or the Netflix documentary's right. But, Rafe, we're going to have to end it there. We could go on and on with this, I've no doubt. But, Rafe heidelman thank you very much for your time. That was, of course, Rafe, the royal broadcaster and commentator. Now, folks, you're watching Real Britain, and I thank you very much for doing so. There's loads more still to come. We've got a show stuffed fuller than the time tunnel. But first, here's the latest weather forecast. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking wet at times, and some rain pushes northwards, though drier further south. Let's look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it should be a largely dry end of the day. A few showers are possible, but many will have clear skies to start the night. Also mostly dry in the southeast with clear spells after an exceptionally warm day. It will be a very mild evening, though brisk winds. A few showers are possible across Wales, and here some low clouds may lead to hill fog in parts. Otherwise, it will be largely dry. Also, a little mist and murk is possible for the West Midlands. Most, though, will have a dry evening with clear skies. Still breezy, so temperatures not dropping much, meaning it will still stay mild. It will be somewhat cloudier in the northeast here. There will still be some showery rain at first this evening, turning drier and clearer from the south as we go through the night. A cloudier and wetter picture across much of Scotland as spells of rain continue to push northwards, perhaps heavy for some, turning a little chilly under any clear breaks that develop. Some showers are likely this evening across Northern Ireland. It will also be blustery here, but plenty of clear skies. A relatively mild evening given the time of year. The rain in the north will clear overnight, meaning it will be largely dry before heavy showers feed in from the west. my show Farage 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday and there you will get opinion analysis debate and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch you've been cancelled join the club oh my goodness mate. and then for the last 15 minutes talking pints we're over a drink we have a civilized conversation with someone we very often disagree but we do it in a grown-up way come and join me on Farage We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each Helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. <laughs> Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Hello and welcome back. This is Real Britain on your telly, radio and online. Thanks for your company. Coming up in this hour, the SNP suffers the biggest ever backbench revolt over a transgender bill. We'll also talk about fracking, banned, unbanned, then banned again. The fracking hokey cokey. And what's going on with trains in the northwest. But first, here's the news. Good afternoon. It's two minutes past three. I'm Alice Porter in the GB Newsroom. 
A whistleblower at an asylum processing centre in Kent has told GB News the government is not acknowledging the true extent of the crisis there. The worker at the Manston military base claims violence, disease and attempts of self-harm are a daily occurrence at the facility. The processing centre is only supposed to hold asylum seekers for no more than 24 hours before transferring them to longer-term accommodation, but many have allegedly been there for weeks in unsuitable living conditions. Former Chief Immigration Officer Kevin Saunders says the problem lies with the legislation. 80% of people coming across the channel are from Albania. And we do have legislation, of course, that we can remove them. However, and here's the problem, the um, people that advise these uh, refugees are saying, just say to the UK authorities that you've been trafficked, because once you've said that, they can't remove you. Meanwhile, at least 12 small boats carrying around 500 people have been intercepted crossing the English Channel so far today. Authorities are still actively responding to other sightings. Border force vessels and lifeboats are taking them to Dover. They'll then be transferred to the Manston military base for processing. The UK has denied Russia's suggestion that the Royal Navy was responsible for the Nord Stream gas pipeline explosions last month. The Ministry of Defence dismissed it as false claims of an epic scale, saying Moscow is trying to detract from its disastrous handling of the illegal invasion of Ukraine. It comes after Russia declared the end of its mobilisation campaign after reaching its target of 300,000 reservists. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky says he doubts Moscow is done with calling up soldiers. The head of the Royal Navy has ordered an investigation into what he's called abhorrent allegations of sexual assault and harassment in the submarine service. Admiral Sir Ben Key says the behaviour will not be tolerated and is not a true reflection of what service life should be. He says anyone who's found to be culpable will be held accountable regardless of their rank or status. Octopus Energy will buy collapse supplier Bulb after the deal was given the green light by the government. Octopus says it's paying the government above market value to take on the company's 1.5 million customers. Business Secretary Grant Shapp says the move brings vital reassurance and energy security to consumers across the country at a time when they need it most. The deal is expected to be completed by the end of the month. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of the murder of a university student in Manchester. Luke O'Connor was stabbed in the early hours of Wednesday morning and later died in hospital. A 19-year-old is being questioned by police. Thousands of mothers are demonstrating across the country demanding reforms to childcare. The Halloween-themed protest called March of the Mummies is calling for urgent progress on women's rights. They say expensive childcare, along with poor maternity and paternity benefits, are pushing mothers out of the workforce and into poverty. They want the government to increase funding for the sector. Beth is a mum who's marching through central London today. Unfortunately, when I go back to work, I basically will be giving my entire salary over to um, my childcare costs. So essentially it's not worth me going back to work, but I want to go back to work and I want to be part of the workforce and I love my job and I don't want to take a career break, but unfortunately I, I will have peanuts to survive on, which is really difficult when you want to uh, spend time with your daughter, uh, do fun things and there's just not enough money. Railway staff in Scotland are staging a 24-hour walkout over a pay dispute. More than 2,000 members of the RMT union are striking and passengers are being warned to expect widespread disruption. ScotRail say the latest offer gives the lowest paid staff a basic pay increase of almost 7.5%. But the union is calling for a rise that's more in line with inflation. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to The Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's coming up on this next hour. The Scottish National Party suffered its biggest, larger, its largest backbench revolt. Basically, Scotland's now finally having a debate over something. Isn't it great? In, in 15 years of SNP in power, they've actually only now 
decided to have some internal dispute. On this bill that purports to make it easier for transgender people to change their legal sex. With one minister resigning in order to vote against the plans. Is Nicola Sturgeon losing control? And Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will reinstate the England-wide moratorium on shale gas fracking. That was lifted by his predecessor Liz Truss, remember her? But restoring the ban has been described as beggar's belief by some pro-fracking groups. And finally, the government is preparing to intervene if Avanti fails to deliver significant improvements on its West Coast mainline. They've been given until the 1st of April to improve its services following a summer of reduction of trains. So that's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, I'd love to know your thoughts, much more important than mine. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. I've got them open here. You can watch us online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of cracking content on our page. Cheers very much. Now, as I mentioned there, Nicky Sturgeon, Scottish Government has passed stage one of a gender recognition bill, which aims to speed up the time it takes to obtain a gender recognition certificate and also lowers the age of obtaining one from 18 to 16. The bill caused the resignation of the SNP's Community Safety Minister, Ash Reagan, amid concerns regarding the safety of women. Well, with me now to discuss this is an esteemed panel Christopher McElhenney, the General Secretary of the ALBA Party, Murdo Fraser, Conservative MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife, and Austin Sheridan, a former SNP Glasgow City Councillor, Michelle Ballantyne, Reformer Leader of Reform UK Scotland, an esteemed panel. Austin, I want to start with you, if you don't mind. I always like it. I like the fact that you come on shows like this. I really, really do, because we don't get many SNP members who will actually give us the time of day, unfortunately. But I want to start by asking you, what do you make, what do you think of your fellow panellists, some of which, some of whom disagree vehemently with this bill and actually argue that it's going to lead to, to Scotland's women and maybe even children to be unsafe? What's your message to them? Uh, thank you very much for having me on then. The First Minister did say we should reach beyond the ranks of our own, so that's me contributing to what the First Minister asked me to do. But in terms of the of the issue um, that you're discussing is that I've, I believe that we should be respectful in debate. Um, I believe that people have got genuine concerns, then they should be allowed to air them um, and we should be able to discuss them. Um, in a calm manner. Unfortunately, when this has been discussed, it has become very heated. I've seen lots of hate being batted back and forth from all sides of the argument on this. But fundamentally, what I think we need to do is look at the facts of the matter. And that the fact is that you don't need, um, you know, permission to be trans. People can be trans. People can change their names on documents such as their passport, their bank statements, and live as the gender that they choose to live. That is not something that this legislation impacts upon, uh, what this is simply allowing them to do would be to change their sex on their birth certificate, joining countries like Ireland, Norway and Denmark. So Christopher McKelney then, General Secretary of the ALBA Party, you want an independent Scotland, so I'm assuming that you would like an independent Scotland to be as progressive as countries like Ireland, surely? Well, I, th I think it's two, two separate. Oh, good afternoon. I think it's two separate issues. Um, independence, of course, being about the right to determine your own future and make your own choices. People, obviously, um, such as Murdo, will have a you know a different view on whether that's best for Scotland. But um, on the specific issue of GRA, um, I, I agree with Austin. The debate has been poor. You know, many people. I think most people in Scotland, I would include myself. And this group uh, believe that people should be allowed to love who they want to love, be who they want to be, dress how they want to dress, call themselves what they want to call themselves, refer to themselves as a you know a trans man, a trans woman, and you know most people don't care, you know, particularly what people want to do in their own private lives. But when it comes to the specifics of you know in which <laughs> a very important issue, the protection of a female only spaces or single sex spaces. You know, I, I think that's something that, you know, many women have had their opinions invalidated on. 
Um, I think it's really legitimate that, you know, females should be allowed to have female-only places, you know, whether that's, you know, things that are perhaps difficult to talk about during daytime TV, such as rape refuge centres, um, um, you know, women that have been, you know, victims of, you know, violence by males. Uh, these are certainly triggering um, issues in yeah. of you know of a woman ended up in one of these places and someone who identifies as a woman but you know is quite evidently a male-bodied person that that's a traumatizing experience and, and I think the bill doesn't have adequate safeguards in it. Um, there was a rebellion as you mentioned, some seven SNP MSPs. I, I suppose technically there was a rebellion in Murdo's party because I think you know his party was certainly opposed to the bill, but then one of his members voted in favour of it, showing that you know this isn't a an issue that you know falls down traditional party lines, but the the, the important well, fact is this is only stage. It's just going one, one, just one, one final Absolutely. point is this was only yeah. stage. It's it's only stage one, and I think in stage two and stage three you'll see four, five, six, seven, even you know up to a further ten SNP rebels of the government don't listen to what are the valid concerns of women. Yeah. So Murdo Fraser, then we're we're already seeing, are we not, a difference between a difference between the rest of the UK and, and Scotland. I mean, you've even had, as far as Nicola Sturgeon's Euro dreams are concerned, the European Union say, well, you would have to adopt the Euro, which, of course, isn't in the SNP plan for independence. So I'm wondering, this is going to create a difference between England and Scotland, thanks to devolution, that's going to potentially put women at risk. It's mad. Yes, Darren, and I mean, I don't disagree with really pretty much anything that Chris has just said. I think he and I probably would come from a very similar place on these issues. Uh, and what's been interesting about this whole debate is that while I think everybody would agree precisely with what Chris said about you know, having a liberal society where people are free to, to, to live their lives in the way that they want, the, the concern, and it comes in particular from, from women's groups, from well known feminist campaigners like uh, the, the writer uh, G.K. Rowling, is that this bill as drafted does threaten women. And it threatens women because uh, the, the SNP cannot answer a basic question, which is what is the impact on the Equality Act 2010 yeah. if a gender recognition certificate can be issued to anyone who does not need a medical diagnosis anymore, who can simply get one by signing a piece of paper, self-declaring, and after three months, will be able to legally change their sex. And does that then mean a man, a biological man, without any uh, evidence of gender dysphoria or any surgery, will then be able to enter spaces currently reserved only to women in terms of the Equality Act? And that is where the concern lies. Now, interesting here, the Equality Act is a UK piece of legislation. And according, I think, to yesterday's Daily Telegraph, uh, the Prime Minister is looking at potentially strengthening the Equality Act to enhance the protection of, of women and girls. Now, that would lead to a very interesting conflict between what the Scottish government are trying to do and uh, what the UK government are legislating for across the UK. And we'll need to see how that plays out. But the, the only other point I'd make in closing is Scottish public opinion is not supportive of these changes. And we've seen a number of opinion polls which say that by a substantial majority, people in Scotland are not convinced that a move to self ID without any safeguards uh, for anybody over the age of 16 is the right way to go. Michelle, before I bring you in, that's Michelle Ballantyne there waiting patiently. Austin, Nicola Sturgeon there, You've, you had JK Rowling, as Murdo says, wearing a, a T-shirt that said, Nicola Sturgeon, destroyer of women's rights. Is she a bigot? Well, I mean, I mean J.K. Rowling can wear what she wants to wear. It's certainly not the kind of language that, that you know that I think is appropriate, and I think it's extremely unfair as well. I would say that the you know that the if you look at women and we look at rights um, that are being taken away from women, um, you know, if you look at a global sense, we've got abortion rights being reversed in America. We, we can see what's going on in Iran at the moment. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah, it's, and it's men, and it's men that are these things. Nicholas Sturgeon's government um, hasn't done anything to deplete women's rights. Um, that, um, Nicholas Sturgeon's also made clear uh, that the GRA le legislation will be in line with the Equality Act of 2010. All right. Uh, very, very clear about that. Okay, let's so put that to Michelle no Ballantyne then. Right. Let's put that to Michelle. Do you actually think J.K. Rowling's a bigot? That is what she gets called online for, for defending 
the, the right to protest against this particular legislation? No, no, not at all. I mean, the problem we've got is um, the, the minority agendas have become very strong, particularly in the parliament. And if you disagree or you object or you make comment against the way that people often attacked is by calling them, you know, uh, transphobic, by calling them, you know, homophobic, the, these these sort of actions by calling you a bigot, by, you know, and, and this is designed to frighten people to hold their opinions to themselves and, and not counter some of the actions that have been taken. And it is very interesting when, when you look back at the whole how the parliament operates, you know, devolution was enacted to bring decision making closer to the people. And yet here we have a decision that is progressing through parliament that is not in the interests and the majority of the people. So it's, it's actually pulling it away from the people. And even in, in if you look at the, the bill's progress itself, you know, they had 10,800 individuals responded to one of the consultations. And yes, they weeded out a few that were replicas. But at the end of it, they had 59% of the individuals who responded saying they didn't support the principles of the bill. And only 38% supported. And the evidence they were given and this happens in a lot of the committees in Hollywood. They cherry pick and highlight the evidence that supports the government's direction of travel, and they minimise and suppress the evidence that is not considered supportive of the direction of travel. So you, so you end up with bills going through, and they always say, oh, we'll amend it at stage two, or amend it at stage three, it could be voted down, it could be got rid of. You know, virtually no. I'm not sure whether it's none or whether it's just one or two bills have ever been stopped. That's an important st point. Stage one. And yeah. that's where the Hollywood system is going completely wrong. Christopher McKelney, I want to put that question to you because I think with a lot of this stuff, a lot of my viewers are saying, well, mm -hmm. how can this actually happen in Scotland? Why is this happening? Because there doesn't seem to be, in the same way that there is in Westminster, a large amount of scrutiny, a large amount of, of journalistic, uh, you know, looking at the legislation, scrutinising what the legislation actually means in practice, if this becomes law. And I'm wondering, do you think there is a problem in Scotland with actually the, the, the general sort of scrutiny and, and holding to account of the Holyrood government? Well, I, I think certainly there, there, there can be a strengthening to the, the Holyrood committee system. Um, I, I think that it's very often a, a party whipped system. Westminster, which I know I think <laughs> I could sit all day and list the problems it's got, but one of its strengths is it's a uh, it's select committee system. You know, people manage to find themselves into the chair of those committees through merit and they don't rely on whips to, to appoint those positions, whereas in Scotland, um, not just the government, of course, you know, the whips effectively determine who's on the committees and they determine who chairs the committees, and all too often we see the committees basically just serving the, the political need of the government and indeed the opposition's party parties serving the needs of their, their political opposition. So I think that's a fairly you know pertinent point. But on the Gender Recognition Act, you know, it did go through a parliamentary committee, um, it, as Murdo knows, it is at stage one. Um, there was probably more public awareness brought to the issue because of the contributions made by people like Murdo, who I don't agree with yeah. on you know many constitutional matters, but this is an issue that I think it does highlight this problem we've got in modern society that if, you know we disagree on A and we disagree on B, we can never agree on C. You know, but I think this is an issue that clearly people have been able to work across party lines. Um, they've found themselves, you know, aligned to people that they probably wouldn't find themselves aligned to on other issues. Because I think it is bigger than party politics, well, which is clearly, why it would be clearly, it would be a real shame of the SNP decided to censure its yeah. MSPs for voting for. You know, this all is right. quite clearly, you know, a woman are saying I can't on good conscience there. vote. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Christopher, but we're going to have to leave it there, sadly. And we'll bring you all back to follow this as this debate unfolds. But I tell you what, I don't think it's uh, very good listening for, for Nicola Sturgeon. I think she's got a real problem on her hands here. But Christopher McKelney, the General Secretary of the Alba Party, Murdo Fraser, the Conservative MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife, Austin Sheridan, a former SNP Glasgow City Councillor, and Michelle Ballantyne, former leader of Reform UK Scotland. I thank you all for your time and contribution. Now, folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. After the break, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who reinstated the England-wide moratorium on shale gas extraction, 
has, which was lifted by his predecessor Liz Truss, he's brought it back. It's the hokey cokey, the fracking hokey cokey. It's been described as beggar's belief by some pro fracking groups. We'll discuss. First, though, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking wet at times, and some rain pushes northwards, though drier further south. Let's look at the details. Right. Starting off in the southwest, and here it should be a largely dry end of the day. A few showers are possible, but many will have clear skies to start the night. Also mostly dry in the southeast with clear spells. After an exceptionally warm day, it will be a very mild evening, though brisk winds. A few showers are possible across Wales, and here some low clouds may lead to hill fog in parts. Otherwise, it will be largely dry. Also, a little mist and murk is possible for the West Midlands. Most, though, will have a dry evening with clear skies. Still breezy, so temperatures not dropping much, meaning it will still stay mild. It will be somewhat cloudier in the northeast here. There will still be some showery rain at first this evening, turning drier and clearer from the south as we go through the night. A cloudier and wetter picture across much of Scotland as spells of rain continue to push northwards, perhaps heavy for some, turning a little chilly under any clear breaks that develop. Some showers are likely this evening across Northern Ireland. It will also be blustery here, but plenty of clear skies. A relatively mild evening given the time of year. The rain in the north will clear overnight, meaning it will be largely dry before heavy showers feed in from the west. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays.
Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on digital radio. Now, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has reversed Liz Truss's plan to allow fracking and has paused the approval of new fracking sites. The move has been met with concern from many who feel the UK's energy sector is in dire straits ahead of this winter and we need all the help that we can get. Many, including the head of Quadrilla, the largest UK fracking firm, have voiced complaints about the constant flip-flopping on the fate of the UK's energy sector. It's what I call the fracking hokey-cokey. Well, with me now is Conservative MP for Workington, Mark Jenkinson. Mark, good man, nice to see you. I want to ask you, and I say, come on, Conservatives, is this really a government that's on the side of the Workington man, or indeed woman, who are worried about paying their energy bills and are absolutely terrified about their mortgage? Well, look, Jordan, I've always taken the view, thanks for having me on, by the way, I've always taken the view as a Conservative that it's not for government to stand in the way. It's not for government to decide if fracking's viable. It's not for government to decide uh, if, if it's profitable uh, or if it'll shift any uh, energy prices necessarily. It's just not for government to stand in the way. And if we're going to stand in the way using um, seismic movements like we did in 2019, and our manifesto commitment, by the way, was just that we would um, we would continue fracking if the science uh, can prove it's safe, and it does. If we're going to ban fracking on the basis of, of, of seismology, seismic events, then that will also have a knock-on impact on geothermal energy and, of course, future construction. Yeah, so is this a sign then that, you know, Rishi Sunak is saying, well, to hell with Britain's energy security, Instead, I want a virtue signal to the green extreme. Well, I think it's a sign that number 10 is spooked by fracking. Last week, we saw number 10 spooked by fracking. I was in the whip's office up until, up until Thursday. Uh, and a week on Wednesday, we had a vote on fracking. Labour tried to take control of the order paper, but quite an obvious confidence motion in the government to, uh, to, to try and to, to hand Labour control of the order paper. Um, everyone agreed it was a confidence motion. We'd got the number of... Um, absolute abstainers down to seven and that's how it ended up but in the meantime number 10 got spooked by fracking uh, and that ultimately their their, their uh, overruling of the whips office ultimately brought down Liz Truss's government and here we see just a matter of days into the job and number 10 spooked again by fracking we had a perfectly reasonable position done and that is that local communities were able to make their own decisions on fracking uh, and that there that, that to me is absolutely what we should be about if a local community wants it who are we to stand in the way i want to put to you this piece on the uh, sunderland air show market being cancelled for, for net zero i know it's not in your patch but it's in mine and it's not a sign surely of local authorities another sign of local authorities beginning to make the drastic decisions that are, of course, necessary prerequisites of our net immiseration via net zero. I tell you what, I loved that air show as a kid, and it breaks my heart to think that the next generation won't be able to enjoy being a spectator to some of that, you know, pomp and circumstance in our air by our RF. I mean, what do you make of the fact that this sort of thing's happening? We're being, uh, there's this miserable approach to policy making in Britain, whilst China is burning more coal than Sauron's Mordor. I mean, it's obscene. <laughs> It's a nonsense, and it really is a nonsense. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. There are people who will not be happier until we are colder and poorer. Uh, you know, the, there are policies. I mean, obviously not the air show, but there are policies that people that people on the on the left predominantly advocate that will be harmful to lives. It will it will kill people. Um, my my constituents didn't vote Conservative to be poorer and colder, but they do support getting to net zero as quickly and sustainably as possible while it's not making them poorer and colder. And that's the key. 2050 is 28 years away. We've got a lot of time for technology to step up uh, and, and, and deliver us the, uh, the, 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 the things that we need to get to net zero without making my constituents colder and poorer. And that there is a perfect example of, of the nonsense at the altar of net zero. Exactly. Mark, in a sentence, very briefly, if you would, what do you make of the Prime Minister not attending the COP27 climate conference? 
Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a real statement of intent from the Prime Minister to focus on domestic issues. The Prime Minister never normally attends COP26, just once every four or five years. But we've seen Ed Miliband kick up this, this week about it. Ed Miliband attended on behalf of Gordon Brown. Absolutely. It's a statement of intent, I think, from the Prime Minister to focus on domestic issues, which is what my constituents want to see. Absolutely. We'll leave it there. Conservative MP for Workington, Mark Jenkinson, thank you very much for your time. Now, folks, these are with GB News on telly and DAB radio. After the break, the government is preparing to intervene if Avanti, the train network, fails to deliver significant improvements on that West Coast main line. They've been given until the 1st of April to actually improve these services following a summer reduction of trains. But now it's time for a check on those news headlines. It's 3.33. I'm Alice Porter in the GB Newsroom. A whistleblower at an asylum processing centre in Kent has told GB News the government is not acknowledging the true extent of the crisis there. The worker at the Manston military base claims violence, disease and attempts of self-harm are a daily occurrence at the facility. The processing centre is only supposed to hold asylum seekers for no more than 24 hours before transferring them to longer-term accommodation. But many have allegedly been there for weeks in unsuitable living conditions. Meanwhile, at least 12 small boats carrying around 500 people have been intercepted crossing the English Channel so far today. Authorities are still actively responding to other sightings. Border Force vessels and lifeboats are taking them to Dover. They'll then be transferred to the Manston military base in Kent for processing. The UK has denied Russia's accusation that the Royal Navy was responsible for the Nord Stream gas pipeline explosions last month. The Ministry of Defence dismissed it as false claims of an epic scale, saying Moscow is trying to detract from its disastrous handling of the illegal invasion of Ukraine. It comes after Russia declared the end of its mobilisation campaign after reaching its target of 300,000 reservists. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says he doubts Moscow is done with calling up soldiers. Octopus Energy will buy Collapse Supplier Bulb, taking on its 1.5 million customers after the deal was given the green light by the government. Business Secretary Grant Shapps says the move brings vital reassurance and energy security to consumers. The sale is expected to be completed by the end of next month. Thousands of mothers are demonstrating across the country, demanding reforms to childcare. The Halloween-themed protest, dubbed the March of the Mummies, is calling for urgent progress on women's rights. They say expensive childcare, along with poor maternity and paternity benefits, are pushing mothers out of the workforce and into poverty. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun. Every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. 
It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me from 9pm to midnight every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on your digital radio. Now, next up, the government has signalled that it's ready to intervene if Avanti fails to significantly approve its services on the West Line. The company has come under fire after having a heavily reducted train service in this summer after staff disputes, strikes and a lack of required drivers hampered services from Birmingham to Manchester. Tell you what, there are certain disgruntled members of the GB News staff. Transport Minister Kevin Foster has said that Avanti now has an opportunity to improve or face being placed under government management, with Labour insisting its failure is a demonstration of the need for nationalisation. With me now is the former Labour adviser, John McTurnan. John, I thank you very much for your company. This is a sign that Jezza Corbyn was right all along, isn't it? Oh, look, it doesn't really matter who controls the railways. If you've, got a, if you've got a strike and you've got people working to rule, not working on rest days, there's not enough drivers around. That's the problem. The fundamental problem is the, the lack of staff um, and the way that the, the unions are restricting uh, working on their, on their non-working days, which has always been relied on in the industry. So I think it's, it, it doesn't matter if it was nationalised or if it was privatised. Um, there'd still be this labour dispute, and it's probably better to be honest, for the dispute to be with private sector companies rather than with government, because I think governments are quite weak when it comes to unions. Yeah, and aren't we seeing, surely, with the, the government rigmarole of, of pay disputes up and down the sector, mm. whether that be the justice sector, the healthcare sector, you name it, John, we're seeing these disputes over pay. Mm. Doesn't it show, and some of my viewers are saying, well, hang on mm. a minute, this all comes down to trade union power? Yeah, well... None of the none of the strikes are of the scale that we used to see in the 1970s. The number of days lost through industrial disputes is tiny, and the real issue, and I'm sure your your, your viewers get this too, um, and the listeners on radio, but the, I, I'm sure that, that all your audience get that when inflation's at 10%, uh, if your pay increase, if your pay doesn't increase to match that, you're getting a real terms pay cut. I think that's why there's probably a lot of public sympathy for the strikes now uh, when there normally isn't sympathy because everybody's feeling squeezed, not just by the, um, uh, the, the enterprise, which there's some help from the government, but you know, 3,000 people a day are coming off fixed rate mortgages and they're paying hundreds more, having to face paying hundreds of pounds more every month. And so I think that pressure gives people sympathy for the unions and the unions have been quite clever, quite canny about not really disrupting too much, just making making their point and then moving on. So I think um, you know the government need to pr you know, either need to step in and fix this dispute or step right out and let the companies do a deal because we know there's a deal there. Yeah, I mean, do you reckon then that the clambering of you know disgruntled train users Will that actually lead to larger calls, insurmountable calls, that make nationalisation unavoidable? Well, I mean, I think you've got to look now for future policy. You've got to look at the Labour Party. Um, when the Labour Party remains at over 50% of the polls, even with the change of Prime Minister, it does seem quite likely there'll be a Labour government after the next election. And Keir Starmer has been very clear about this. He was clear at conference. The railways will be renationalised, which I I understand to be that the rail the, the you know the train operating companies are going to be taken back into public control. Um, that will need to be uh, thinking on the labour side about how do you get more train drivers? Um, where do you recruit them from? How do you train them? It takes take, there's a long lead-in time for training for, for train drivers because it's such a um, rail safety is such a big issue. But I, I suspect yeah the the, the, the the train that's left the platform essentially on, on renationalizing the railway is the question is really what's the form and can that actually improve the quality of service? Because in the end, very few people uh, in the Labour Party and the country as a whole want nationalization in itself. They want it to improve the service. And that is the big challenge. And that's what, you know, Andy Burnham's complaining quite rightly uh, about the terrible service to Manchester. And 
you're saying there's some um, GB new stuff who are hopping mad as well. Um, yeah, oh, so like, I think a lot of people are having frustrations getting to Houston to find out there's no train. And John, I'm wondering then, does this, is this a dilemma for Labour because the Labour are preparing for government even, mm. and, you know, getting ready for a general election and all the rest of it. Will mm. this call into question, a question mark around how you pay for all of this? Because if we're bringing the mm. rail network into mm. the state's sector mm. and we're saying, right, well, to attract more train recruitment, we're going to have to pay better salaries. Yeah. So that then leads to, well, we need to raise taxes in order to pay for that, doesn't it? Well, I mean, I've been speaking to um, a conference, I was speaking to leaders uh, in the rail industry, and their issue is first to get more people onto the railway again. Because there's a big, there's a you know, there's a big hit during the pandemic to to rail usage, and you've got to get people back into the habit of using the railways. And I think there's some very clever managers who've got ideas about how you increase passenger usage, and then how you how you you know want to get people back on the rails, how you can price appropriately to be able to pay for an efficient service, invest in the service, but also pay the staff the right thing. You know, that, the great thing about it being privatized and being com you know, commercially minded, people run it and they want to they want to market, they want to sell, they want full trains. And so I, like, I think um, it would be entirely possible to run it either privately uh, or nationalized and raise the usage of the, of the railways because, uh, you know, whatever people's views about COP, um, everybody believes that going by train can often be the best solution and it is, you know, it's a good way of, of tackling climate change. All right, John McTernan, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your contribution, as always. Right. John McTernan, their Labour Party advisor. Now, folks, next up, we're talking about Cambridge University. Now, Cambridge has apologised to students for causing them distress, oh dear, after sending an email. I just want to give up at this point. I really, really do. After sending an email promoting a talk by an author called Helen Joyce. Now, Helen Joyce believes that trans activists are actually eroding the concept of biological sex. And she was invited to speak and debate that topic. Now, her visit was met with a protest in the college running a simultaneous welfare event for concerned students. Now, this led to Arif Ahmed, the professor who organised the event, to state that Cambridge is a university, not a primary school. Doesn't look like it, folks, does it? Well, joining me to discuss this is a Professor James Tooley, Vice-Chancellor of Buckingham University. Now, James Tooley, I'm assuming you're going to tell me that Buckingham University has students with a spine. I, I, I can tell you that. But look, don't, don't, don't get too depressed about this, Darren, because look, there's, there's, there are, there's some good news from this story, isn't there? The first bit of good news is that you've got people like Arif Ahmed who are willing to go ahead and organize events which you know, are going to be controversial, but which are about free speech, about academic freedom. That's the first bit of good news. Second is that there are, the legal situation does actually protect people like Arif Ahmed. Um, that, uh, you, know, you know, the Maya Four started case made um, this the view of Helen Joyce a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act. There's an Education Act going back to 1986, and a new Education Act coming in, which it reinforces it. So the good news is we can do this in universities at Buckingham. Yes, we do it all the time. But at Cambridge, there are things going on which are great. The bad news, of course, is the way some people re responded, and the, the the master of the college, um, what, uh, uh, Professor Pippa Rogerson, uh, um, and the head of the Department of Sociology from the University of Cambridge more widely. Yeah, they came in and. That, that 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 relationship with a primary school is 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 well 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 heard, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Um, I mean, James, very odd. Very interesting. What do you say to my viewers who are concerned though about the next generation, who who are saying, "Well, hang on a minute. Do you really believe that students in the likes of China, for example, are getting their knickers in a twist over inviting a speaker to come and speak at a university and things like that?" Actually, no. They're talking about how they tool up the next generation. To, to either be fighters or, you know, industrialists, goodness only knows what else. And actually, we're yeah. having squabbles here in this country over Helen Joyce, who strikes me as a, you know, relatively uh, friendly, nice woman. Yeah, I mean, her book um, is probably on the polemical side, you know, as an academic, yeah. Kathleen Stock's book on a similar topic is much more uh, uh, precise and... Um, and, and academic, but that's even more opportunity, isn't it? You invite someone who's written a book about an important topic 
she's journalistic in style, slightly polemic. What better way to cut your academic teeth than if you're a Cambridge philosopher or sociologist, you can go in there and engage in discussion with her. The, 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 the whole thing about academic debate is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. You move debate forward in that Hegelian dialectic. And what are they trying to do at Cambridge? They're trying to shut this up. As you say, in other countries, we're not doing this, but don't despair, though. In different parts of the university, you know, remember there was that vote recently, wasn't there, in Cambridge University, where the, uh, the yeah. academics from, from, the, from the engineering and science departments, they didn't want any of this, let's abbreviate and call it woke, woke stuff, did they? They wanted proper scientific stuff. There are universities that are doing this stuff. Buckingham is one of them, and you're right to point that out. But, but it's good that Cambridge is doing this. And Cambridge is, with people like Arif Ahmed, have put their cards on the table they're able to do it, and they weren't stopped. That's the good news, isn't it? So what, in, in a sentence then, James, what, what can actually be done to protect academic freedom? Because it does seem to me that, you know, university really is the best time to actually be exposed, dare I say, to dissenting views and opinion, to actually form your own mm. opinion about things. That's how we've advanced, yeah. as you rightly say, as a society through the tools of, of speech and debate. Are we at risk of yeah. losing that? How do we protect it? Yeah. How we don't protect it is by offering those students who are upset tea and cake. That's what they offered in the Cambridge situation. Tea and cake instead of energetic, strong debate about crucial issues. We offer strong debate. Look, you, you, you've got viewers, I'm sure, out there are involved in universities or parents of students who are concerned about these issues. We don't give up. That's the key. Where you started your the talk here, Darren, it says like we've got to give up. No, we're not giving up. We've got great people at Cambridge. We've got great people at Buckingham. There are other universities that have got great things going. We will march forward and we will win this debate about academic freedom and free speech. Don't despair. I hope so. I really hope you're right. We'll end it on that note of optimism, James. I think that's a perfect way to end it. But I have been to Buckingham University. I think it's a beautiful place that you've got. Um, and if yeah. more universities were like yours, James, I think we wouldn't even be having this conversation. But thank you very much. Well, Professor you. James Tooley, Vice Chancellor of Buckingham University. I wasn't paid to say that, by the way, I promise. Now, <laughs> folks, lots of you have been getting in touch today about a whole load of issues. Ian had this to say. He says... You have highlighted yet another example of Sturgeon dreaming up new legislation that's neither needed or wanted. Purely so she can say, oh, look at us, we're making up legislation, aren't we just like a real government? Well, actually, Ian, the terrifying thing is that this radical reform to the Gender Recognition Act will have real consequences as far as women's rights are concerned. And um, I worry about 16-year-old kids as well, suddenly being able to say, well, I'm not Arthur, I'm Martha and without a hint of intervention by therapists and all the rest of it. I think it's actually, it goes much deeper than Nicola Sturgeon trying to make herself look like a real government. It has real world consequences. Alan says, it is madness to extend the fracking ban when the proper testing and evaluation has not been carried out. We need to know what gas resources there are and how much that might add to national wealth when we're facing an energy crisis. I've said this myself, Alan. I've, I said, if, if there wasn't a business case for fracking, which is what a proponents of banning it say, well, why would any business bother exploring it? They wouldn't, and then it wouldn't happen. So you get what you want. If there is no business case for it, if there is, then the market says, OK, we'll invest our own money and time in exploring this. Hunky-dory happy days. We get gas that we need. Sarah says, maybe we should nationalise the railways. This sort of incompetence is an embarrassment when we compare it with our neighbours. No more delays. Sarah, a lot of my viewers are of the view that it's frankly ridiculous, faintly ridiculous, that a lot of European investors actually own much of the British railway. But I'll leave that as an open-ended question. Lewis says, surely the problem with Harry, Prince Harry, I assume, and his book is that it has been written. No matter what he changes, the original still exists. It's not under lock and key like in the past. It's on computer drives and disks. Someone will have a copy, and one day, when the time is right, the original text will surface. Well, I think that's probably fair enough, because a lot of people will be eager 
to get their hands on what Prince Harry really wanted to see. Paul said, if Suella is allowed to do what she wants to do, she will carry the party to a landslide victory at the next election. Paul, I think you're absolutely right. Suella gets it. If Rishi follows Suella, the Tories will respect that 2019 mandate and maybe, just maybe, Labour won't be at 50% in the polls. Moving on, King Charles has highlighted the lack of vocational education available, describing it as a great tragedy, as not everyone is academic. The comments were made before he became monarch and reflected the efforts of his charity, the Prince's Trust, at cultivating apprenticeships for young people. Now, these comments, the latest comments, come as there has been an effort to expand vocational education in recent years, with the government expanding the scheme and introducing new T levels for training. Well, with me now to discuss this is Tom Richmond, founder and director of the EDSK Think Tank. Tom, thank you for your time. Is King Charles right to call for more vocational education? Is the government not doing enough, frankly? It's not just this government that hasn't been doing enough, it's previous governments going back at least 10 years, if not more, which have prioritised academic education over pretty much everything else. We've seen a huge expansion in young people going to university. Around 40% of 18-year-olds now go straight into higher education after leaving school or college. And if that's right for them, that's great. But the problem is over the last 10 years, apprenticeship opportunities have collapsed for young people. There used to be about 300,000 young people doing an apprenticeship each year, if you look back 10 years. Last year, it was about 160,000. So I think it's really important young people get a choice. But at the moment, university is quickly becoming the default choice rather than giving young people a choice for great apprenticeship instead. Well, exactly, Tom. So how do we say to a 16-year-old kid... You're not a thicko if you don't go to university because that's the narrative that's now being created because so many kids are, as you say, it is the norm to go off to university when actually some people would be better suited to highly paid, dare I say, apprenticeships and other vocational forms of education. Yeah, and this goes back, back to Tony Blair's rather famous target of 50% of young people going into higher education, which I think was, was well-meaning. I don't think he meant it as a bad thing around apprenticeships and vocational education, but the problem is that government has started to put all its money into sending kids off to university. And we know now, of course, that young people can easily leave a university degree 50 to 60,000 pounds in debt. And a lot of them are very unlikely to ever pay back that debt, which means that future taxpayers have to pay back that debt instead. So it's not just about giving students a good choice of a university or an apprenticeship after they leave. It's really important for taxpayers, not just current future taxpayers, but future taxpayers as well, that they get a good deal. And this is why I'm worried that the government's got the balance wrong for a long time. There is some cause for optimism. As, as you may have seen, the new education secretary is Gillian Keegan, who is herself a yes. former apprentice. That a hasn't happened for a long one. time, and I'm really pleased to see it, but it might not solve the problem all by itself. Yeah, just briefly, if you would, I'm coming to the end of the programme. Do you actually think in this post-Brexit moment when we're, you know, experiencing labour shortages in certain markets, that actually this will alleviate that by bringing more young people, training them up, upskilling them? You would have thought it's the perfect opportunity, wouldn't you, over the last four or five years since the Brexit vote to get these skill shortages solved by training more and more apprentices all over the country at different levels. And that, to me, makes it even sadder. This government still hasn't focused enough on those apprenticeships. They can invest more in apprenticeships whenever they want to. They've got to get onto it sooner rather than later. Perfect. Tom Richmond, their founder and director of the EDSK Think Tank, I thank you very much for your time. Now, folks, I also thank you at home who've been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers for your company. This show's on every Saturday at two o'clock. But for now, I'm going to leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking wet at times, and some rain pushes northwards, though drier further south. Let's look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it should be a largely dry end of the day. A few showers are possible, but many will have clear skies to start the night. Also, mostly dry in the southeast with clear spells after an exceptionally warm day. It will be a very mild evening, though brisk winds. A few showers are possible across Wales, and here some low clouds may lead to hill fog in parts. Otherwise, it will be largely dry. 
also a little mist and murk is possible for the West Midlands. Most though will have a dry evening with clear skies, still breezy so temperatures not dropping much, meaning it will still stay mild. It will be somewhat cloudier in the northeast here. There will still be some showery rain at first this evening, turning drier and clearer from the south as we go through the night. A cloudier and wetter picture across much of Scotland as spells of rain continue to push northwards, perhaps heavy for some, turning a little chilly under any clear breaks that develop. Some showers are likely this evening across Northern Ireland. It will also be blustery here, but plenty of clear skies. A relatively mild evening given the time of year. The rain in the north will clear overnight, meaning it will be largely dry before heavy showers feed in from the west. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You just caught me being bossy. Uh, camera six, please. Thank you. <laughs> Hello and welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. Over the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. Joining me today is broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy and also political commentator Albie Amancona. Before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Good afternoon, it's four o'clock. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. A whistleblower has told GB News the government isn't acknowledging the true extent of a crisis at an asylum facility. The worker at the Manston military base in Kent claims violence, disease and attempts of self-harm are a daily occurrence. The processing centre is only supposed to hold asylum seekers for up to 24 hours before transferring them to longer-term accommodation, but many have allegedly been living there in unsuitable conditions for weeks. Former Chief Immigration Officer Kevin Saunders says the problem lies with legislation. 80% of people coming across the channel are from Albania. And we do have legislation, of course, that we can remove them. However, and here's the problem, the um, people that advise these uh, refugees are saying, just say to the UK authorities, that you've been trafficked, because once you've said that, they can't remove you. 
Meanwhile, at least 12 small boats carrying around 500 people have been intercepted crossing the English Channel today. Authorities are still actively responding to other sightings. The UK has denied Russia's accusation that the Royal Navy was responsible for the Nord Stream gas pipeline explosions last month. The Ministry of Defence dismissed it as false claims of an epic scale, saying Moscow is trying to detract from its disastrous handling of the illegal invasion of Ukraine. It comes after Russia declared the end of its mobilisation campaign, after reaching its target of 300,000 reservists. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky says he doubts Moscow is done with calling up soldiers. The head of the Royal Navy has ordered an investigation into what he's called abhorrent allegations of sexual assault and harassment in the submarine service. Admiral Sir Ben Keyes says the behaviour will not be tolerated and is not a true reflection of what service life should be. He says anyone who's found culpable will be held accountable regardless of their rank or status. Octopus Energy will buy Collapse Supplier Bulb after the deal was given the green light by the government. Octopus says it's paying the government above market value to take on the company's 1.5 million customers. Business Secretary Grant Schapp says the move brings vital reassurance and energy security to consumers across the country at a time when they really need it most. The deal is expected to be completed by the end of next month. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of the murder of a university student in Manchester. Luke O'Connor was stabbed in the early hours of Wednesday morning and later died in hospital. A 19-year-old is being questioned by police. The parents of a black man who was shot dead by police have submitted a letter to Downing Street. Chris Carber was unarmed when he was killed in London last month. His parents, along with other bereaved families whose relatives died in custody, are calling for changes to the justice system. They're demanding an urgent meeting with the new Prime Minister, Home Secretary and Mayor of London. Thousands of mothers are demonstrating across the country demanding reforms to childcare. The Halloween-themed protest called the March of the Mummies is calling for urgent progress on women's rights. They say expensive childcare, along with poor maternity and paternity benefits, are pushing mothers out of the workforce and into poverty. They want the government to increase funding for the sector. Beth is a mum marching in central London. Unfortunately, when I go back to work, I basically will be giving my entire salary over to um, my childcare costs. So essentially, it's not worth me going back to work. But I want to go back to work and I want to be part of the workforce and I love my job and I don't want to take a career break. But unfortunately, I, I will have peanuts to survive on, which is really difficult when you want to uh, spend time with your daughter, uh, do fun things, and there's just not enough money. Just Stop Oil protesters have sparked public anger in South and West London. Yes, other people agree with you, but you're causing an inconvenience to the public and it's not right. Drivers took matters into their own hands, dragging demonstrators off four busy roads which were being blocked. The campaign group says more than 60 supporters caused traffic delays in their bid to get the government to halt all new oil and gas licences. More than half were arrested. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Nana. Good afternoon. It is fast approaching six minutes after four o'clock. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquare. Whilst the rest of us are dealing with real-world problems like how we're going to afford to pay our bills on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as dealing with all our personal traumas in an increasingly hostile, unforgiving world, our wealthy friend, a.k.a. professional victim Prince Harry, finds himself in a similar predicament. Having walked away from a job that meant he didn't actually need to have any money on him, to, to a lifestyle which requires him to actually work for a living, what a shocker that must have come as. With nothing but the fact that he's a prince, uh, as his real credentials, yes, he has been in the army, but he left the UK and that doesn't really pay well anyway. He's resorted to selling his soul. 
And what a roller coaster of trumped up revelations it's been. His latest foray, a lucrative book deal, had to be postponed because, frankly, it would have been somewhat unsavoury for him to launch his truth in memoirs, the first in a series immediately after his grandmother, the Queen's death. Instead, his book, which it has been revealed will be called Spare, in relation to his positioning in the line of succession, will be unleashed on January the 10th next year. For goodness sake, I mean, so many people saying they're going to buy this thing. Seriously? You want to hear about a man who is considerably richer than you, who grieved after the death of his mother, which was very sad, but then went on to marry a woman who appeared to have the effect of decimating the family and then calling someone a racist, which has clearly had a negative influence on his relationship with the rest of his family, in particular his brother? I can't see how Diana would be happy to see the two of them at loggerheads. How he's run away from the UK for privacy and is now selling his soul to make ends meet because he's finally discovered that things cost money, especially if he wants to live next door to Oprah. It should be called Spare Us. Spare Us the Detail. I'm absolutely not helping to fund this lifestyle of whinging. And out of the many millions that he's going to get for the book to soften the blow and make him look a little kinder, a small proportion of the proceeds will be going to charity. He'd know all about charity. The British taxpayer's been funding him for years, and in, me in my view, he's pretty much turned his back on this country. It's reported that the tone of the book changed from its original conception, yes, yes, very wise, and that now it is a remarkably moving personal journey from trauma to healing, ending with the eternal power of love over grief. He calls this healing a clear rift between himself and his family and passing on his trauma to them in a book to be released only months after his father has lost his mother. How ungrateful. There's nothing like pulling up the drawbridge after you've left the castle. Sorry, before we get so we back. Before we get stuck into the debate, here's what else is coming up today for the Great British Debate this hour. I'm asking, should foreign aid be cut? According to Treasury sources, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak could freeze the country's foreign aid budget for a further two years in order to combat the cost of living crisis. Now, the UK was spending 0.7% of its national income overseas before it was cut to 0.5%. And Downing Street say that they will need to make some difficult decisions to help balance the books. So should foreign aid be cut? Then at 4.50, it's the Royal Roundup and Royal Biographer Angela Levin will be spilling all the palace gossip with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at the centre once again of the controversy. Prince Harry's new book, Spare, will be on the shelves early next year, but what does the title say about his mindset? Then coming up at five, it's difficult conversations. Now, it's estimated that 13 million women are menopausal in the UK. Now, of course, this is uh, the last few days of uh, Menopause Awareness Month, and many women experience many of the symptoms, including hot flushes, sweating, and a lack of energy. Well, what can women do to help with the process? Unfortunately, when our blood sugar drops, we produce the stress hormones from it. It will give you a craving. Mm. Your body will go after a quick fix, like mm. you know, a cakes. biscuit or chocolate cake or something. Okay. But you don't want more of the stress hormones being released due to a pattern of eating, because that's going to trigger more of the hot flushes and symptoms around it. I'll be speaking to Dr. Marilyn Glenville with regard to that. And that's on the way in the next hour. Tell me what you think on everything we're discussing by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Right, let's get started. Let's welcome again to my panel broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy and also political commentator Albie Amon Kona. Welcome to you both. Nice to see you. Lovely orange. I like Thank that. Thank you so much. Well, look, you were nice too. and bright. And yes, yes, you were right. Yeah, like, <laughs> 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 a bit dull in the centre there. We might as well start with you, Albie. Um, what do you think, then? Um, this book's spare. Well, I'm actually looking forward to buying it, Nana. I think... You know, I don't think that's probably a surprise. You know that I'm quite into Meghan and Harry. But, but look, I think it's going to be an interesting read. Obviously, this is... This is a book about the life of a very interesting man. He's always giving us lots of things well, to talk about. Well, you say that. You haven't read it yet. Well, he's a very interesting... I think he's led a very interesting life, obviously. Lost his mother at a young age, served in the British military, was a member of the British royal family, has now moved over to the US and is forging a new path. Mm. And a role for himself with his two new children and his wife. So I think I'm looking forward to the book 
coming out, I'm looking forward to having a read. Oh, God. And what about you, Lizzie? Well, I heard on the grapevine the publishers wanted to call it Gone with the Whinge. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all about... <laughs> poor me! I'm such a victim! Oh, no! This is my story. Listen, you know and I know King Charles does not want this book to come out. Exactly. Yeah, and he's already... Uh, Prince Harry's already gone back to try and rehash it. Look, the Queen only died September the 8th. Yeah. And already he's got this book coming out. Yeah. And I think it's so ungrateful. I think it's selfish. And for someone who's gone through grief, sadly lost his mother, he should know what grief's about. His poor father is going through grief. The whole family, his brother, mm. to do this book, I think, is quite disgusting. I hoped he would drop it. He's saying it's not for the money. Then what is he doing it for? To, to, to I think, personally, because they want to bring down the monarchy. They want to bring down the whole institution. And this is his way of saying, poor me, why is it called spare? Why is it why called is, despair? Why is it feeling, I mean, you know, because, you know, in, in the Spanish version, yeah. that is in the <clears> shadow, <throat> meaning, you know, poor him. Does he not forget his own father brought, um, you know, Megan down the aisle, walked her down yeah. the aisle? I mean, it, it might, I mean these, he, might, they... he might feel like he's in a shadow, but he's in the limelight in a shadow. I mean, he is the... He's a prince, for goodness sake. If you can't even be, you know, thankful for that and not realise how fortunate he is, I just find it a complete whinge fest yet again. But... I'm not going to buy that. I can't be bothered, cos it'll be the same old thing. Oh, it was terrible. This happened to me, that happened to me, this happened to me, this is what it's like with raw life. And basically, I, I don't think the rest of his family don't want this. I, I, that sounds a bit. I think the reason it's called Spare is because, obviously, we're, we're quite used to this royal concept of, you know, the royal family wanting an heir and a spare. Mm. And, you know, it'll be about what it's like to be called the spare all the time. Imagine growing up and knowing that you weren't the favourite, that you weren't no, the important but, listen, one. That, 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 that I, must listen, have been that quite difficult That happened in my life. I was the second child. Well, Nobody sure, wanted me. But, but the point <laughs> is... <laughs> it happened. Is he's just, he's just going to be talking about his oh, life. And I think we should probably just, just judge the book once we've actually read it well, before we tell us judge I will. But he's got a Wife, he's he worships. Yes. Wonderful children. He he's got his so-called freedom that he so wanted so badly. Lives in a 15, 16 million dollar pad with a guest house, nine bedrooms. You know, this is what you wanted, Harry. So if he's well, got, then if he's why got his freedom, just... why don't you let him finish about his life? No, but this is because his family are grieving and he knows yeah. this is gonna cause a massive press frenzy. As soon as this book is, you know, we get snippets of it, it's gonna be everywhere. How is that going to be for his father, you know, and for his brother, it's all awful. the members of the family, it's so to be inconsiderate. honest? It is selfish, it's ungrateful, and he should be ashamed of himself. Why didn't he stop pointing his royal finger at the royal gravy train, get an identity, do something, you know, you enjoy, and talk about that. Stop going back in the past and, and saying we awful and to. trashing our old, the to. royal family. <clears throat> if you can't say anything nice about your family, don't say anything at all. Well, what do you say to that? I mean, Albie? Well, we don't know what the content of the book is going to be. Hopefully. He might be saying saying nice things about his family, but he might also be saying difficult things about how he felt at various points during his life. And look, I just think, before we prejudge the book, we should actually wait and see what's in the book, and then if there are things that we don't like, then we can have a discussion yes, about that. Yes, but the point of it is, is that he's actually releasing the book whilst his family are definitely going through a grieving process. So he's releasing the book then, which already is inconsiderate. There are going to be things in the book that aren't particularly uh, easy reading for the family, and they are very uncomfortable. It's clear that they're uncomfortable about it. If I was doing something that would be making my family feel that uncomfortable, I would reconsider, and I don't think I'd be doing that. Even if I didn't get on with them, this would not be a way that I'd be making my living. I would need to find an identity within what I'm doing and not using other people to justify my existence. I, I think to, that's right. I have to say, oh, look, our hearts all went out to him when his mother died. The whole nation was crying with him and for him. Yeah. Um, but he hasn't got the monopoly on death. I mean, I lost my father very young, mm. but I know... T I would really hurt people if I said certain things, certain things about my father or yeah. parts of my life to the rest of the family, and I just wouldn't do it. But you have a sense of loyalty, and his seems to have gone down the, the toilet. But this is exactly my point. We don't actually know what he's going to say, and we already know that some of the content of the book has been changed. Yes, yes. I think the exactly. date has also been delayed. Why, so it's though? Not, it's why was not that? Because totally, he was panicking, because not, he saw totally, the nation. Well, it would have been... It's had, not had, totally inconsiderate well, it would have been for the had, content to yeah. change he, and for the date of the release to be delayed. But it would have so been obviously, they wouldn't. Well, because... we, we don't know because we've not seen the content well, of the book. So if he... the content of the book is awful, 
I think we can be critical of it once we've read it at that point. But to be critical before we've even seen the content of the it's book, the concept. And we've just seen, seen, the, we've just the, seen the title it's and the, the front concept. cover. It's the concept. But look at the, it's the whole, track it's the whole record of them. Of they, they did That's that awful interview with Oprah Winfrey just before Prince Philip mm. passed away. Look at their track record. Do they care? Oh, yeah, they care about themselves, and that is it. I mean, what, I'm what sorry would you to say, say to that? That's true. The, to, Prince Philip was in hospital, and they were still doing the Oprah interview. I mean, and it's clear Prince Philip is very, was very old at the time, and those around him would have known how serious his condition was, and he passed away not shortly after that. So I'm wondering, well, would you say that that was compassionate in, in your view? No, look, clearly there Probably. were elements of the Oprah interview which were really bad, even and, the couple, it, and the couple did not come, well, up, come off the back of that interview they were very well. It, interview. it appears that there were untruths told in that interview, mm -hmm. and if there are similar untruths in the book which is yet to be released, then I will be critical at that point, <sighs> but I'm not going to be critical before I've even read the book. Why put I'm your sorry, family through that? You, you can't awful. say that there, there's alleged racist in your family um, with no proof. No name, and that you know, it's, it's not, not fair. And this book's going to cause nothing but hurt, it's upset. Exactly. And this is a family in grieving. It's a nation still in grieving. They should have more respect. Well, that's the last word from you, Lizzie. You're with me. I'm Nana Aquare. This is GB News on TV, online, and on digital radio. After the break, it's time for our Great British Debate this hour. I'm asking: Should foreign aid be cut? Now, according to the Treasury sources, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak could freeze the country's foreign aid budget for an additional two years to combat the cost of living crisis. But is this the right way forward? Send me your thoughts. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk. Tell me what you think. As ever, you can tweet me at gbnews. I've got a poll up right now asking you whether you think that foreign aid should be cut. Cast the vote now. But first, let's get some weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking wet at times, and some rain pushes northwards, though drier further south. Let's look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it should be a largely dry end of the day. A few showers are possible, but many will have clear skies to start the night. Also mostly dry in the southeast with clear spells. After an exceptionally warm day, it will be a very mild evening, though brisk winds. A few showers are possible across Wales, and here some low clouds may lead to hill fog in parts. Otherwise, it will be largely dry. Also, a little mist and murk is possible for the West Midlands. Most, though, will have a dry evening with clear skies. Still breezy, so temperatures not dropping much, meaning it will still stay mild. It will be somewhat cloudier in the northeast here. There will still be some showery rain at first this evening, turning drier and clearer from the south as we go through the night. A cloudier and wetter picture across much of Scotland as spells of rain continue to push northwards, perhaps heavy for some, turning a little chilly under any clear breaks that develop. Some showers are likely this evening across Northern Ireland. It will also be blustery here, but plenty of clear skies. A relatively mild evening given the time of year. The rain in the north will clear overnight, meaning it will be largely dry before heavy showers feed in from the west. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week.
Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune-in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Twenty-two minutes after four o'clock. This is GB News on TV, online, and on digital radio. At Nana a queer welcome. If you just joined us, where have you been? Listen, before the break, we were discussing Prince Harry's memoir. Let's see what you've been saying. Jody says money talks, Nana. That's the reason why Harry's releasing this book. Anne says, I think I trust this book will be stocked in fiction in the fiction section of the bookstores. <laughs> Very good. And June says, no one in this world can possibly relate to Prince Harry's life and emotions. Even Prince William has always been in a totally different position. He could see his wife was being treated like his mother and felt resentful all over. Well, perhaps the book will reveal all of that. We'll see. If you're going to read it and buy it, probably you will. I won't be. But right now, it is time for the Great British Debate. Thank you for those. And uh, this hour, I'm asking. Should foreign aid be cut? Pressure is increasing for Rishi Sunak to freeze foreign aid, uh, the spending currently at 0.5% of GDP, for an additional two years in order to balance Britain's books. Now, it's enshrined in law that aid spending should amount to about 0.7% of GDP in line with the UN advice. But, of course, during COVID, uh, the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson temporarily lowered it to 0.5% to reflect uh, the hit to the economy and, of course, the huge cost of furlough. However... High inflation means that spending across the board will have to be cut back if Rishi Sunak is to get the economy back on track. But any move to keep the cut to foreign aid spending in place is likely to lead to a sizable backlash. So what do you think for the Great British Debate this hour? I'm asking, should foreign aid be cut? I'm joined by political commentator Matthew Stadlin in the studio. Matthew, right, what is, what's your view? Foreign aid, it's 0.5% of GDP. Should it be cut? I think it was one of the good things of David Gam Cameron's administration. I'm sort of gently left-leaning, mm -hmm. but I think it was a good thing that he enshrined that in law. It's a difficult thing to argue, Nana, because when I used to have this debate on my LBC show, people